So let's take a look at actions. They can be used to play the same thing over and over on a whole bunch of images. Now in the actions folder here, we have two files, 2152 and 2153. And they're for the most part, the same sort of file. Maybe you want to do a portfolio of all of your best food photography from your entire career. So you've dug through your archive drives and you found a bunch of PSDs and JPEGs and TIFFs and some of them have layers and some of them are 8-bit and some of them are 16-bit. The first thing when you're doing actions is to find an image that's representative of what you want to do on average to all of the images. So if you've got some that have layers and some that are flattened, find an image that has layers in it so that in the action you can record a flattened image step. If you want a bunch of 8-bit images and you have some images in there that are 16 bits, open up an image that is in 16 bits so you can record and you know, convert from 16 to 8-bit step in there. So find something that kind of represents all your images. Now, in that folder, like I said, both those images are essentially the same thing. They're the same size, they're the same format. Um, so let's just start with the top one, 2152. So when you get a chance, pop into the Actions folder. Open up that image, ADL 2152, and we're going to run a series of steps on it, but we're going to record it as an action. And imagine you have a client who uh, you've got like, you know, 100 images you know, 50 images, whatever. And he wants a full resolution TIFF version of each one. And they want a low resolution JPEG that they can use for like, you know, social media or, you know, just to have around to kind of quickly reference images and then before they go find the big version of it. And he wants them saved into a folder broken up into two groups, TIFFs and JPEG. So there'll be two subfolders in there. Let's go through the process. So pop into the folder there. You'll see the ADL 2152. Let's open that one up. And let's see where we find our actions. Uh, if you don't have your actions panel open, go under Window and choose Actions, and you'll see your action panel. You'll also see in there a folder called Default Actions that have a whole bunch of default actions that are installed when you install Photoshop that nobody ever uses. How many people have used one of the actions in the, see? Nobody ever uses them. Um, now, the thing about actions, you can save them. Let's say you came up with this awesome action um, that you do every time you do a, a landscape image. You do a level that does this to the trees, you do a hue and saturation that does this to the sky, and you do that every time. And you're like, I could just record this as an action. Well, you'd probably want to give it a descriptive name. You'd probably also maybe want to use it on some of your other computers. You can save actions, but here's the catch, you can't save individual actions. So let's say I wanted to save one certain action. If I select just one action, Let's do the frame channel, what the heck. And I go to the pop-up here, set, oh, I can't save the action. The only thing you can save is this folder here, which is called an action set. And from there, you can save that as a .atn file. Uh, so you'll probably not want to use your default actions. You'll probably want to make your own action set. At the bottom of the actions panel, you'll see well, it looks like a folder, uh, but it's not a folder. It's an action set. Just like in layers, it looks like a folder, but it's not a folder. It's a group. Uh, this is a set. If you click the new set icon, I'm going to call this Greg's Actions. Hit return, and there's a new action set. So this is something that you could save. There's, I could save this empty action set folder that has nothing in it. So it won't let you save a single action, but it'll let you save an empty folder. There's logic for you. So let's go through the process of actually making an action. So call up the image. Let's make a new action set just so you can save it. Call it whatever you want. I called mine Greg's actions. You'll probably call it something different. And to start the process, we're just going to, at the bottom of the actions panel, click the new action icon. Right between the trash and the little uh, action set icon is a little, looks like a rectangle with the corner folded up. Again, in the layers panel, it would make a new layer. In the actions panel, It'll call up a new action. And let's talk about this window up here. First off, it's asking for a name. Most of the actions that I do are workflow actions. Usually I've got a bunch of like, you know, PSDs and I just want to make a bunch of little JPEGs. So usually I just call mine, I just like blah, 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 on the keyboard and just do a bunch of random stuff. Um, and you'd be surprised how often it's pronounceable. It often sounds like some kind of like Icelandic word. Um, but if it's something that, you know, oh, every time I do a baby portrait, I do this because, you know, the baby skin looks like they look like little lobsters. So I do this to the reds and uh, you could give it a name. Um, I'm just going to call mine. I'm doing this job for a big client, so I'm going to call this Big client, there we go. Um, and you can choose a different set. I mean, I'm going to put it into the Greg's actions because that's the one that I just made. Uh, 
you can assign a function key. If it's something that you do a lot, like maybe every time you shoot a wedding, every wedding picture, you do, you know, I, there's your full-size TIFF, there's your low-res JPEG, and, and I did this wonderful effect to it. Um, and you do it a lot. You could assign a function key to it. So F5 would run that action. Or if F5 is already taken by something else, you could assign a modifier key. So Shift Command F5 will run this action. I'm not going to put a function key to it, but you could. You could also assign a color to it, which would kind of help it stand out in the list of actions in there. I mean, I don't really have any yet, but if I had a whole bunch of actions, I could assign a color to it. Again, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give it a name and hit, are you ready for this? Record. And you'll notice, once you hit record, this little red dot starts to glow. Just like, uh, you guys remember like tape decks and stuff? Uh, when you record something, that little red light comes on. And it's always like a, a red circle button that you push. Um, so it's recording everything we do in Photoshop. So it's fairly important not to do extraneous stuff. Uh, don't like say, oh, I forgot to do this other thing for a client and call up an image and do a bunch of stuff on it, because that'll actually get recorded into the action. Um, it won't record stuff you do outside of Photoshop. So if in the middle of recording an action, you pop in and check your email, it's not going to check your email every time you run the action. Uh, but it will record anything you do in Photoshop. Of the things that can be recorded, like, you know, it, you know fairly simple things. It's not going like, to, you know, record you retouching an entire image, as we discussed. Well, let's do our first step. So this is a client that wants a full res TIFF of each of these and a low res JPEG separated into individual folders. So a TIFFs folder, a JPEGs folder. And when we scale that JPEG down, they want it to be like, you know, 600 pixels on the longest side at 72 pixels per inch. When you scale it down, it might need a little bit of sharpening. So we'll put some sharpening in there as well. So let's do the first step in this. They want that TIFF version. I'm just going to throw it onto the desktop. So I'm going to choose File, Save As. And on the desktop, I'm going to make a new folder. Now, if you make a new folder, that's not going to get recorded into the action, but the folder itself will. So if I hit new folder here, and I'll call this big client output create, it actually made a folder on my desktop called big client output, uh, but it's not going to make that folder every time I run the action. But it will remember, oh, there's a folder on the desktop called big client output. We're going to put it in there. Plus, they want this into a folder called TIFFs. So I'll make a new folder, call it TIFFs, because again, I like to be creative in my naming. And for the format, they want it to be a TIFF file. All right. And you can see that it's going to call it ADL2152.tiff. Now, you'll also notice that that is highlighted in blue, ready to be renamed. Should I rename the file at this point? No, why not? What would happen if I did? For all of them. And if I ran this on, say, 100 files, what would I end up with in that folder? One file called whatever I type in there. If, if I put a name in now, it'll save it under that name. And when I run it on another image, it'll save it into that folder with the exact same name, so it will overwrite it. And if I ran it on 1,000 other images, it would overwrite each time. And when I was done, I would have one file in there with that name. So do not rename your files at this point. All right, so I'll leave it named as is. I'm going to hit Save. And let's just quickly talk about these options here. <sighs> Image compression. Is image compression a good thing? Well, I guess it depends on what your goals are. Um, if you're trying to make a file as small as possible, then yes. If you're going for maximum image quality, is compression a good thing? Not if you use a lossy compression scheme. Uh, zip or JPEG are bad. I don't even know why they have a zip option in there, but the, the JPEG is bad. Um, LZW, Lempel Zev Welch, what do you think about that one? it's actually OK to use. It's what's called a lossless compression format. And when you're saving something as a TIFF, there's no reason not to use it. You're not going to get huge amounts of saving. You're not going to take like a you know, 100 megabyte file down to like 10 megabytes. But you might take it from 100 megabytes down to 50 or 60. Which, if you're uploading a bunch of stuff to you know, an FTP server, or uh, you know, you're putting as much stuff as you can onto a, a key or onto a disk for the client, uh, can make a difference. There used to be a bit of a penalty in terms of the time it took to save it. It is more mathematically intensive. And when computers were slower, it did take longer to save a TIFF. But nowadays, it's basically real time. So there's no reason not to use LZW compression. So I'm going to throw that on there. Uh, don't worry about this. Don't worry about this, this, or this. It's a flattened image, so there are no layers. Uh, pixel order and byte order relate to really old computer systems. Um, so it doesn't matter what you put into there. 
and we're just going to hit OK. And that is our first step recorded. Look at that. Under Save, there's all the stuff we put in there. So it tells it where to save it, what file format to save it as, and ostensibly what name to call it. But having left the name as is, it'll just leave the name as is. All right, let's go on to the next step. They want a low-res version, and they want it to be 600 pixels on the long side. And this is a vertical image, so I'm guessing the long side would be, oh, the height. And they want it at 72 pixels per inch. So let's resize this image down. And there are some potential pitfalls with resizing an image. Let's take a look at those. I'm going to go under Image, Image Size. Oh, I need to change both parts of the resolution. The pixel dimensions, how many pixels by how many pixels, or you know, how many, you know, the total image size. But I also need to change the resolution down here, 72 pixels per inch and 600 pixels high. Which should I put in first, do you think? The 600 pixels or the 72 pixels per inch? I would do the 72 pixels per inch. Watch what could go tragically wrong if I do the height first. If I put in my 600 pixels on the long side, awesome, it becomes 600 by 398 pixels, which is really low res, but this is just for you know, web use reference, stuff like that. And then I change the resolution to 72 pixels. <gasps> Look at what happened. The height dropped. So set your resolution first, then go back, and then put in your pixel dimensions, all right? And when I hit OK, phew, really small. Now, if we zoom in there, we're going to see that it is really pixely looking. Look at those pixels. They're huge. But the image is meant to be viewed kind of you know, about that size. So we're OK. It could be a little bit sharper, though. So you know, let's run an unsharp mask on this. I'm just going to pop in and go under Filter, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask. And because it's such a low res image, this radius should be fairly low. When we were talking about sharpening, we said, you know, if you can see the halos, like you can see she has a dark line over here because this is the dark side of the edge. She has a light line over here because, you know, that's the light side of the edge. If you can see those halos, it's a sure sign of over sharpening. So I'm going to ease that off a little bit, probably around like, you know, not even a half a pixel. There's before and there's after. Yeah, so you know, find a good amount, bring that radius way down. I don't think we need a threshold on this. Well, meh. yeah, we'll go with that. Again, at a normal viewing distance, it just gives it that nice little bit of crispness that'll look good on the screen there. And I'll hit OK. That also got recorded as a step in the action. All right, I think we're ready to save this up. So let's go under File, Save As. Hmm. They want it in its own folder called JPEGs. Should I make the new folder now? If I made a new folder and called it JPEGs, where would that folder end up? Inside the TIFFs folder, wouldn't it? Um, so I'd have my TIFFs in the TIFFs folder and then a folder called JPEGs. Um, how could I get this into that big client output folder? Well, if you're on a Mac, It'll be this little pop-up here. Right from your computer, right through to your desktop, which is where I put mine, there's the big client output, and there's the TIFFs that was selected by default because that was the place we saved the TIFF. But we're going to do a different format in a different folder in the big client output. So I'm going to go back to my big client output, make a new folder, which I will call cryptically JPEGs. I like to keep things mysterious. And for the format, I'm going to choose JPEG. Now let's talk about this JPEG compression stuff. Like we said, compression, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, depends on your goals. And if you're trying to make things as small as possible, well, you kind of have to go with compression. So I'm going to hit Save, and a window's going to pop up that says, OK, but how much compression do you want to give it? And let's, let's talk about this for a second. There'll be times where you'll be saving JPEGs. You know, the client's going to want, oh, I got like a thousand images of like a wedding or whatever, and you've done all the retouching and fantabulous stuff. But for simplicity's sake, they want JPEGs. Or maybe you're, you're doing like a, a website, you're putting in you know, a Squarespace or whatever, and you're going to put those images, you want to do a big web gallery of all your stuff. And of course, you want things to look as good as possible, right? So you're like, well, I'll just do maximum quality compression. If I put this up to maximum quality, 12, I mean, this is a really small image, it's like 600 pixels. And without any compression, it's around like 900 kilobytes, not quite one megabyte. With quality 12, it goes from, you know, 900 kilobytes down to 147. That is a lot of space we've saved. Um, what might happen, if, let's say you, you, you said, you know, I'm just going to put everything as high quality TIFFs onto my website, onto my web gallery. What's going to happen when somebody arrives to look at your stuff? It might take a while to load, mightn't it? 
I mean, you might think, you know, it's, it's like a megabyte, but, you know, and, and, and hard drive terms and stuff, like, you know, four terabytes is like 120 bucks, so I mean, it's not much of an issue. But when you start getting into downloading stuff, if someone has a bit of a slower connection and they arrive at your site and things take a really long time to load, what are they probably going to do? They're probably gonna click out of there, aren't they? So if you can bring that size down, um, it can make a big difference in you know, the amount of stuff you can fit on a disc or whatever, but also how fast things are gonna pop up on someone's screen. And at quality 12, it went down to 147K. So that is a really big savings. Um, certainly more than that LZW compression was gonna get you. Now, if I take this from 12 down to 11, Oh, 147 down to 106. So I lost over 40 kilobytes. Um, and let's take a look at the difference in quality. At quality 12, let's zoom right in there. This is closer than you'd ever look. But here's before and here's after. Essentially no difference. There's a little bit around the top of the hair there, but for the most part at quality 12, it's the same thing. If you had like a you know, full resolution from your camera, like you know, 5,000 pixels high, at quality 12, the client wouldn't know the difference. And you might get some clients that actually say, you know, yeah, just send me the JPEG file, that's fine. If a client doesn't specify a format, what format should you send them as the finished file? TIFF, you wanna send them that high quality TIFF. And with the LZW, as we saw, it's a lossless compression. You're not gonna lose any quality. It's not gonna be damaged at all. Uh, if a client does say, you know, JPEG is fine, quality 12, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. And you, that's some pretty good savings, 147K. You could probably email a JPEG to the client. And that might be one of the reasons why they might say, send me a, a JPEG. If it's a big magazine, like, you know, Chatelaine Flair, no, they'll always want a TIFF file. Um, but going down to 11, we dropped 41K, so like almost dropped about a third, but okay, we're starting to see a little bit of damage happening around the top there. Now, at a normal viewing distance, like I said, you're probably not going to see that difference. No, that's pretty much the same. I find around eight is about kind of my, you might hear the term threshold of pain. How much quality are you willing to sacrifice to get that smaller size? Like if you go down to 10, ooh, 78K, we dropped like, you know, what, 30K there around. Yeah, uh, down to 10, down to nine, oh, 66. We didn't lose as much, did we? If we go down to eight, oh, 59, we only lost 6K there. Um, and we're starting to see, oh yeah, look at that, let's zoom in again. This is exciting stuff, isn't it? Look at that damage that's starting to occur. The way the JPEG compression works is it breaks the image into eight pixel by eight pixel chunks, and it compresses each of those squares independently. Um, so. Around eight, I find, is where the trade-off for me starts to happen. 59K, if I go down to seven, oh, 54. Oh, but look at how much the, the quality, the quality starts to drop off really fast below that. Here's six, geez, we barely lost anything. Here's five, yep, but oh, look at that. The color's starting to smush out. Here's with no compression, here's with. And if we take it all the way down to zero, we could go from 49K to 39, ah! it's barely recognizable. And you've probably seen that checker pattern on the internet, something you've, you know, it's been passed around a bunch of times, been recompressed. And that's also one of the things about the JPEG format. If you save something again as a JPEG, it will recompress and compound the damage. So if you've taken a picture on your phone and it's a JPEG and you open up in Photoshop and you do some retouching on it, and you think, well, it was already a JPEG, it's already been compressed, I might as well just resave it as a JPEG it'll actually get a little bit worse. So JPEG, not necessarily a great thing to do to your images, but if they do require it, around eight, I find for me, is my threshold of pain. Um, nine, 10 would be probably good. 10 used to be as high as it went. This 12 came in a few versions ago, um, and that's where there's basically no difference. So whatever your threshold of pain is, set that in the JPEG and hit OK. And we've got three steps, well, four steps recorded so far. Our saving of the TIFF, our scaling it down to 600 pixels on the long side, our unsharp mask to make it a little better, and our JPEG. That's all they wanted, wasn't it? Uh, can we stop recording now? What do you think? Should we just hit the stop button? Or is there one more step we should probably put in there? Let's close the file. What would happen if we just stopped recording now and then we ran this action on 1,000 images? We'd end up with 1,000 images left open, wouldn't we? That would be bad. Uh, so let's include a close step in there. Uh, either Command W or just File and Close. And you can see that gets recorded into the action there. So we're ready to stop the recording. Uh, and just like the old tape decks of old, that little square button, boink, will stop the recording. Are we ready to test this action on our next file yet? What do you think would happen um, if I called up that ADL 2153 and just hit play to test it. 
And here's where a lot of people get tripped up. They think, oh, my action didn't work because let's say I opened up 2153 and I hit play. Look at what's highlighted, the close step. You can pause while you're recording an action. You can hit stop, it'll stop recording. You can do something else and then you can hit record again. So when you stop recording, the step that is highlighted is the very last step in the action. So if I were to run this, it would just close the document and nothing would be saved. And I would look in my output folder, I'd be like, Oh, there's the TIFF that I used to create the action. There's the JPEG that I used to create the action. But there's nothing else in there. I would think it didn't work. So to test the action, you're actually going to want to highlight the name of the action. So click on the name of the action so it'll run all those different steps in there. And let's give it a try on that 2153. We'll just double click. You ready for this? Play. Done. And if I look in the output, there it is. There's the JPEG, there's the TIFF. And if I had you know, 10 more images to go, I could select all 10 of them, double click, I could go play, 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 10 times, and it would run that on all those files. So we can save a lot of time. And there are other um, ways of doing it even faster. There's batch processes, there's droplets. We won't get into those, but um, not this semester anyway. But later on, you'll learn about even faster ways of doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so any steps that, you know, like running filters, stuff you can type numbers in for, stuff you can pull menus down to, rotating, whatever, those can all get recorded into an action. And if you did want to save that action, like that's more of a workflow action, uh, it's unlikely you'd want to use that again. But if it was something that, um, you know, you'd uh, done some fantastic stuff for landscape images, you could, if you select the action set itself. With the action itself selected, go into the pop-up, you won't be able to save it. But if you select the action set, go to the pop-up, you can save that as an ATN file. Watch this. If I select the folder, click this little pop-up, save actions, and I'll just throw that on the desktop, and oh, look at that. It even called it Greg's actions for me. So it'll give it the name of the action set. I'll hit save, and if I look on the desktop, there it is, gregsactions.atn. I could email that to myself on my other computer. I could double click it. It'll load it up into my actions palette and I can just run away with it. Off I go. Um, you may have seen online where you can buy actions from companies where they'll email you this action and you can run it. Better to figure out what the effect was and just learn how to do it yourself. Once you can do the steps that created the effect of that action, you can modify it. A lot of people are getting into this, oh, I found this great action on here, and I found this great you know, 3D lookup table, and I've been running all these things on it. And then they start working with clients, and the client's like, I love this look, but can you change this just a little bit? And they're like, uh, no, because that's what my action does. Um, can you change what an action does? You actually can. If you found this awesome action online, just take a look at it. Go into Photoshop. It'll be inside the little, whatever the folder that they called it, there'll be the action. And any of these little steps here, you can click a little, the little disclosure arrow and see what the steps are. So if it's like a, a levels or a curves or something that it does to it, you can see what it did. And you can modify that. Like right now, we have a, a step that resizes it and then runs an unsharp mask. Is an unsharp mask setting appropriate for all images, like one setting that'll work for everything? No, you're probably gonna wanna play around with that. So, if I turn on this little icon here, that puts a stop in the action. So let's say I ran this action on this 2152 here, and I put a stop here, so I select the action, and I hit play. It'll run through all the steps until it gets to the one that has the stop, in this case, the unsharp mask. I could play around with the sliders, make it look as awesome as I want it to look. I think that's fantastic. And then I can hit OK, and it'll continue on with the rest of the action. So every time I run that action, this little stop will pop up. I can play around with it. So let's say it's that landscape action that does great things to the trees with this you know, levels or curves, does great things to the sky with this hue and saturation. You can put a stop on each of those. Hit play. When it pops up at levels, play around with it. Make it look good for that image. Continue on. It'll call up the next one. Continue on. And when it's done, it'll do whatever the action tells it to do. In this case, we've, we've put its close in there. Um, when you put a stop on it, you'll notice that even if I click the disclosure arrow beside the name, this little icon changes. This tells me, uh-oh, there's a stop on this action. And if I want to make sure that I don't stop anything, I can click this down. Oh, there it is. I can just turn that off, and that stop disappears. You can also skip running a step altogether. Like, let's say uh, they, they wanted the full-size TIFF, but they didn't want the low-res JPEGs. Oh, you know, we're not going to use social media on this one. Just give us the TIFFs. I can turn off the check marks, 
on the steps that I don't need. So if I were to run this action now, well, first off, I know that something isn't going to run because the check mark here has turned red. If I click it open, I can see that it will save a full size TIFF and it will close the file. It's not going to resize it. It's not going to sharpen it. It's not going to save a JPEG. Um, if all he wanted was the JPEGs, I could turn off the TIFF version. Then it would just resize it, sharpen it, save a JPEG, and close it down, no TIFF. So you can modify these steps as well. And if you were to double click on one of these, say like the unsharp mask here, I could double click it. Oops, oh, if I had an image open, uh, I would be able to play around with the settings and that would become the new settings for that step in there. So they're, they're, they're fixable, they're changeable as well. That being said, if you make a mistake when you're making an action, uh, sometimes if you try to go back and fix individual steps, you can actually mess it up worse than if you simply threw the action out and started again.